Take your Bible, if you would, please, this morning. Make your way back to Genesis. We were in Genesis for months earlier in the year and finishing up 2022. But I want you to make your way, if you would, this morning to Genesis chapter 32 will be our text. Genesis 32, not sure if I'll get there, but way back in the Old Testament, there is a book called Hosea. And if you could find Hosea chapter 12, Hosea chapter 12, we might have a verse or two there right at the end, depending on how the Holy Spirit directs our message this morning. I finished last week five weeks of concentrating on some of the women of the Bible. I entitled that series, Women in the Bible That Every Christian Ought to Know. Of course, there's many more than just five that you ought to know as a believer. And it was leading up to Mother's Day, and we looked at five powerful and wonderful women that uh, had hearts for God, were used of God in, in, in tremendous ways, and had much to teach God's people today. And I want to, knowing that from this Sunday, there's four more Sundays till Father's Day, I wanted to change gears and look at some of the men of the Bible. And ladies, I will say the same thing to you that I said to the men when I was using the ladies. Just because I'm using a man today for the message does not mean that there's not truth for the ladies. Like when we used the ladies for the message, it did not mean that there was not truth for the men. And so I do believe today that the message is fitting for every heart and every mind that is in the room. And I want to begin our series today, men, uh, looking at men, with a man named Jacob. And I believe that what God has for us today in the life of Jacob is a very important and powerful place to begin as we make our ascent up to Father's Day. And I want to begin in Genesis chapter 32, our message today, with just a phrase. And I'll begin in, with a phrase about Jacob, and I'll need a moment to preach to this phrase. And then once I preach to this phrase, I should be able to preach application from this phrase. Genesis chapter 32 is not the first time that we meet Jacob. Jacob is born into the world in Genesis chapter 25. But as we begin in our series, it's Genesis chapter 32 and what happens in his life in this chapter that I think is so important for us this morning. And so I want to just take the phrase at the beginning by way of introduction in verse number 24 of Genesis chapter 32. And the Bible says, and Jacob was left, how class? Alone. The verse before that says in verse 22, and he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his 11 sons, and he passed over the ford Jabbok. And he took them and he sent them over the brook and sent them over that he had, and Jacob was left alone. When you get to Genesis chapter 32 in verse number 24, Jacob is experiencing sometimes something that many people experience in their life. And listen very carefully. Life is catching up with them. In Genesis 32 verse 24, life is catching up to Jacob. Life is catching up to Jacob because God is making sure that life catches up to Jacob. When I say life catching up to Jacob, I mean the way that Jacob has lived his life. In Genesis chapter 32 and verse number 24, Jacob would be what I would define today as a nominal Christian man. Jacob knows God. Jacob has had relationship with God. Jacob has been blessed by God. Jacob has served God. Jacob has seen God do some wonderful, wonderful things in his life. But Jacob is a man that is wrestling with God. 
And Jacob is a man that has not fully surrendered to the Lord. Jacob in Genesis chapter 32, verse number 24, is not just alone physically. He, he's alone in his mind. He's alone in his manipulation. He's alone in his plan. If you were to look in Genesis chapter 32 and you would look at verse number seven, the Bible uses some words to describe Jacob in this moment, and I need you to get these words. The Bible says, then Jacob was greatly, what's that word, class? Afraid, and he was what? Stressed out of his mind. You might be a man in this room today, and you're stressed out of your mind. You might be a lady in this room, and you're stressed out of your mind. Jacob is been living his life his way. In the scriptures, especially in the Old Testaments, the personality of, of, the, of the person was dominated many times by the way they were named. If you remember Jacob in his birth, Jacob in his birth is a twin. He has a twin brother and his name is Esau. You know that in the plan of God, even though Esau was born first, Jacob would be the one that God would continue his promise to the world through. And you remember in the book of Genesis that that promise was bringing in the Messiah. You remember that God made that promise to Abraham that through thy seed, the nations of the world would be blessed. Abraham had a son with, uh, named Ishmael. That was not the blessing, but Abraham had a son of faith named Isaac. God would work through Isaac. And then Isaac had two sons, Esau and Jacob, and God would work through Jacob, and God would work through Jacob to bring redemption to the nation of Israel and to bring the Redeemer into the world. When Jacob was born, the Bible says that he was born with his hand on the heel of his brother. His parents named him Jacob, which means conniver, manipulator, trickster, supplanter. Pastor, why in the world would a parent name a kid that way? I don't know other than the fact that they knew by intuition and the way that God led them that this would be the personality of Jacob. And as you read the life of Jacob, Jacob lived up to his name. Jacob caused trouble in his own home through Esau and conniving out of the birthright. When you study, Jacob caused problem in his own father-in-law's home, Laban. And Jacob was a man that lived by his own manipulation and wit. He was a guy that connived and schemed. He was a guy that always had a plan. And when you come to Genesis chapter 32... He's at a place where his problem is bigger than him. His wits are not going to work out. He's not going to be able to manipulate or connive out of this situation. And the Bible says that it brought fear and distress to him. Now, men, I need you to understand a little bit about this. Because, and ladies, because we sometimes can get this way, which means we try to figure out our own problems. In Jacob's case, he needs all of his ducks to line up in a row so this will work out. Jacob has not told his wife some certain things. Jacob's trying to keep his finances afloat. He's trying to keep his family together. He's trying to manipulate things. There are secrets that his wives and his children do not know. There's stress on him for this one. He needs this one domino to line up. He needs this one thing to stay straight. And he's trying the best that he can to juggle his life so that, that, that life will work out. And it's come to a lot of pressure. I find 
And sometimes we can live this way. We live our lives by our own wit, our own ability, our own trying. We scheme, we connive, we try to make ends meet, we try to make things happen. And in reality, we live lives resting on ourselves, not resting on the Lord. By the way, there's no more stressful position in life than for a believer to trust himself and not trust the Lord. So here's Jacob. And all his life, he's lived this way. But God has a plan for Jacob. God loves Jacob. And God knows Jacob. But God knows that what he wants to do in Jacob's life is not something that Jacob is going to be able to, to do in his own ability. And God needs Jacob to come to the end of himself in a full surrender and trust to the Lord. And so God works this out. If you would please come to Genesis chapter um, 31. And look, if you would, just in, <clears throat> I'm sorry, Gen yeah, Genesis chapter uh, 31, verse number one. It tells a little bit of the story here. And he heard the words of Laban's son, this is Jacob, after he had gotten wealthy and gotten his two wives, saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which was our father's hath he begotten all this glory. And Jacob beheld the countenance of Laban, who would be his father-in-law, and be told, behold, it was not toward him as before. Now I'm jumping into this. You remember that Jacob loved Rachel, and Jacob wanted to marry uh, Rachel, and so he went to Laban and asked Laban, Rachel's uncle, if he could marry her, and he said, if you'll serve me seven years, right? Every man would be willing to do seven years prison time to marry their wife, right? And, and you know they have this big wedding ceremony, and they go into the tent that night, and Jacob and uh, consummates his marriage with his wife. I can't explain this, but he wakes up in the morning and it's not who he thought it was. Laban had pulled a trick on him. The trickster was tricked. Okay. And he wakes up and it's, it's Leah. He's upset about that. He goes to Laban and Laban says, we have a custom in our culture. I can't let the younger one get married. The older one's got to get married first. Well, I love the younger one. Serve me another seven years. He serves another seven years. Now he, he gets Rachel. And then you know how he begins, Laban begins to see God blessing Jacob, and Laban begins to move against Jacob a little bit. And you remember how, how Jacob uh, figures out how to get the cattle to breed the right way. This is all storyline. Anyway, Jacob begins to inherit the wealth of Laban. Laban begins, his children begin to realize God's blessing upon Jacob. Laban be, or Jacob begins to realize the countenance of Laban has turned against him. And now Jacob begins to feel pressure and feel fear. Okay, God is using all of this in his life. By the way, men, God will use pressure in your life. You are the one who determines if it becomes stress. Oh, that was powerful. God will use pressure in our lives. We determine whether it becomes stress. When I read the Bible, I think I can take the Bible and tell you that a stressful position is a sinful position. I have seen men stressed out cheat on their wives. I have seen women stressed out go into bad relationships. Stress has, when pressure turns into stress, it shows that I'm not trusting the Lord. So Jacob here, God puts pressure on him. Look, if you would, at chapter 31, verse number three. And the Lord said unto Jacob, what's that word? Return. Return. Return unto the land of thy fathers and to thy kindred and finish the phrase, I will be with thee. Okay, so Jacob had left his homeland. 
And Jacob had left his homeland in Genesis chapter 27. And Jacob had left his homeland for a very important reason. And if you remember the reason, he had his brother. And his brother Esau has realized that Jacob had tricked the trickster again, manipulator again, had tricked Isaac so that Isaac would give the blessing to Jacob instead of Esau. Now, it was always God's plan that Jacob would receive the blessing, but God doesn't need us to manipulate his plan. God's powerful enough to work out his plan. So, so Isaac, or Jacob manipulates Isaac I'll show this to you in a moment. Isaac gives him the blessing. Esau realizes what's happening. And Esau says, when my dad dies, I'm going to kill my brother. I'm going to kill him. So Rebecca comes and says, you got to go. You got to go. Your brother's going to kill you. So for 20 years, they're separated. For 20 years, Jacob inherits all of this wealth and, and God's blessing but, but God has a plan for Jacob. God, Jacob has been living as a believer and, and with God's blessing, but he's also been living with his own wits and conniving and all of this. And God needs Jacob to go home because this is how he's going to work through his 12 boys. This is how he's going to work through taking them into, into Egypt. This is how he's going to work through redemption. This is what he's going to do. And so God says to Jacob, I want you to go home. And when you go home, I'll be with you. So when you understand that, you come back to Genesis chapter number 32, if you would, please. And look, if you would, the Bible says, and Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. He called the name of that place Mahanam. And Jacob sent messengers before him to say his name. Esau, his brother, under the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall you speak unto my Lord Esau, thy servant Jacob, saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants. And I have sent to tell my Lord that I might find grace in thy sight. So Jacob knows he's got to go home face his brother. In verse number six, and the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to thy brother Esau and also he cometh to meet thee and finish the phrase. Now, if you're Jacob, you, you, you're in a pressure situation where Laban is going to kill you, basically is what's going to happen or his boys are going to kill you. God tells you, I want you to go home. And home, there's a man waiting to kill you. It's just like God to kind of box us in, isn't it? And so, so Jacob sees this angelic host there and he, and he knows that God is with him. And so Jacob says, I, I, I need to send word to Esau that I'm coming. I don't want to surprise him and maybe I can find grace in his sight. And the guys come back and say, oh, by the way, He's coming to meet you. Now, if, if it was a, a, a gracious thing, you know, maybe he's got his wife, his children, his family. No, he's got 400 men. Now, if you're Jacob, and you know the last time you saw your brother, he wanted to kill you, and you're coming, and now he's coming with 400 men, you're thinking, I'm a dead man. I'm a dead man. Now, remember, God's working in Jacob's life. So Jacob now has got, to, has got to face this situation. And Jacob does what I believe everybody in this room would do. Go, if you would, please, to verse number nine. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham. What did he do? He prayed, right? He prayed. O God, my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, 
The Lord which said unto me, return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. Lord, um, um, remember what you said. You said for me to leave Laban. You said for me to go home. You said you would care for me. I'm just reminding you of this because my brother's coming to kill me. And I'm doing this because you told me to do it. This is good. That's faith. Here's his humble position. I am not worthy of the least of all the, mer- of the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. True, you scoundrel. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. And you said, you told me, you would surely do me good. You would make my seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for the multitude. I don't know about you, but I would say that's a pretty good prayer, right? So, so Jacob, God's got him pressured. God's got him boxed in with, with two men that want to kill him. God's got him on the move. And Jacob, knowing he needs the blessing of God, goes to God in prayer, a wonderful prayer that ought to be modeled by by God's people. Okay, pastor, then what's the problem? Here's the problem. Jacob prays this powerful and wonderful prayer, and you need to understand this to understand the crutch of the message and understand what God's about ready to do. Come down to verse 13. And he lodged there that same night and took of that which came to his hand. This is after he prayed a present for Esau, his brother. He took 200 she goats, 20 he goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams, 30 milch camels with their colts, 40 kine, 10 bulls, 20 she asses, 10 foals. Guy, I mean, he put a thing together. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants. Every drove by themselves and said unto his servants, Pass over before me and put a space betwixt drove and drove. And he commanded the foremost, saying, When Esau my brother meeteth thee and asketh thee, saying, Whose art thou and whither goest thou and whose are these before thee? Then thou shalt say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau. And behold, also he is behind us. And so commanded he that second and the third and all that followed the droves, saying, On this manner shall you speak unto Esau when you find him. Stop right there. Okay. Not a bad plan. Right? I'm going to try to overwhelm him with kindness. Not a bad plan. Here's the problem. It just wasn't God's plan. Now, don't miss out. His name meant deceiver, manipulator, trickster. What I'm about to show you is where most men live their whole life. And where maybe most ladies live. You just prayed this wonderful, powerful prayer and beg God for mercy and to trust God. You literally got up off of your knees and went right back to trusting yourself. God didn't ask you to do that. Proof he went right back. Look at verse number 20. And say ye moreover... Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he, Jacob said, I will, what are those two words? What? I will appease him with the presence that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he he will be accepted of me? What do you mean you're going to fix this? You, you just asked God to help you, and now you're saying you're going to help yourself. And by the way, 
No man can change any man's heart. Only God can change our hearts. This is, this is where most people live. We want to trust the Lord. We want to go by faith. We know that we need God. But just letting go of the surrender and letting go of the way, we still have our way. We still feel like we want to work it out. We, we want to give him control of our life. And then when the pressure comes, we wrestle it back. I submit to you, that a man who wrestles back control from God over the course of his life is a miserable way to live. I would also suggest to you that God can't use that man or that woman. And one thing about God is he is amazing. Can we get an amen on that? And he knows how we tick. He knows that because he made us. So, so if I was to start calling out your name, Janice and Yvette and Hugh and Malcolm, God knows how to get a hold of their attention. Yeah, he does. Miguel, he knows how to get a hold of your attention. Eric Whitley, the saintliest man in our church in the back, he knows how to get your attention. And God, God knows masterfully how to do it. And so this pressure, Laban to kill him, Esau to kill him, God's got Jacob right where he wants him. And in essence, God says to Jacob, you want to wrestle? Let's wrestle. Now, I grew up watching the WWE, but there ain't a wrestler alive like the Lord Jesus Christ. All of this pressure where, where, where Jacob is trying to figure out how he's going to get out of this, and God comes to Jacob there when he's all alone and says, are we really going to do this again? I asked you to come back. I made you all of these promises. I asked you if you trust me. You said you trust me. And now you want to wrestle it back. You want to wrestle, buddy? Let's wrestle. Now you need Genesis 32, verse 24. And Jacob was left alone. And there, what class? Wrestled and with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, this is the man that was wrestling against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he, this is the man that was wrestling with Jacob, said, let me go, the day's breaking. And he, Jacob, said, I will not let thee go except thou what class? Bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. He said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince... Hast thou what class? Power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed them there. And Jacob called the name of that place Peniel, Peniel for I have seen who class? God face to face, and my life is preserved. For sake of time, I'll stop right there. Bible scholars go back and forth over who was this man that came to wrestle with Jacob. 
I think Jacob tells us. Jacob said, I wrestled that night with God. I wrestled that night with the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, Jacob is left alone. He's all by himself. And all in that, as that mind is just working, I've divided my families, I've got everything, how am I gonna survive this? How am I gonna make this? I really need them to do this. I really need them to do that. I really hope she don't find out about this. I gotta have all of this bouncing. I've got this deal on the back burner, on the burner of the back burner, and if the back burner burner deal goes, then this deal will make it. And if all my ducks line up in a row, I might survive. Somewhere in the middle of that moment, Jacob goes from a mental type of wrestling to a real wrestling match. And in the middle of it, at the end of that thing, Jacob realizes about his life, I've been wrestling with God. And the Bible says that when the wrestling match began, Jacob overpowered the man that was wrestling him. Pastor, how how could a man overpower the Lord Jesus? The only reason that was possible was the Lord Jesus was allowing that. Jacob's will was strong. Jacob could not fully surrender himself to the Lord, that will to wrestle it back. And they begin this wrestling match. I would say to you that it was also of the mercy and kindness of the Lord that he allowed Jacob this wrestling opportunity. If you're wrestling with the Lord today and the Lord hasn't touched your hip, by the way, all of you that have hip problems doesn't mean you're sinners. He didn't want Jacob to wrestle. He wanted Jacob to surrender. And when it was clear that Jacob was not going to surrender, bam. In the primary leverage, the hip went. When you wrestle, you need that leverage. And God touched the hollow of his hip and took his physical leverage out of his ability to wrestle, which was a testimony that God was showing Jacob, you don't have the life leverage to live your life. We need the Lord. With his hip out, Jacob could no longer wrestle. Now he clings. So desperate is Jacob in his realization now that if I'm gonna live and survive this, I gotta have the blessing of God. Time out. You wanna surrender to God before he takes your hip out. I've seen God hurt many a people. They're wrestling. They won't surrender to the Lord. They won't, they won't, they won't. And whatever that life leverage is, sometimes God just touches it and it brings you right down to your knee. That's usually a painful moment. Broken to that, he clings. And he says, the angel says, the Lord says, let me go. Jacob says, not until you bless me. So desperate was he for the blessing of God, proven by this. Stay with me. This message has been great, and it's going to get gooder. (laughs) The Lord looks at him and says, what's your name? What's your name? Yeah. The last time Jacob was asked what his name was, he was asked by his daddy, and he lied through his teeth. And he said, 
I'm Esau. Right? Jacob clinging to God for a blessing. And God says, okay, but if you're going to have my blessing, you're going to get it with my way. And you are going to acknowledge, Jacob, who and what you are. You are going to acknowledge your deceitfulness. You are going to acknowledge your conniving. You are going to acknowledge your manipulation. And you're going to confess it. And you're going to lay it down. That acknowledgement happens when Jacob says his name. What a question for God. You might be here today and you're wrestling with God over who controls your life. Christian person. And you desperately want the blessing of God. But God's not going to give you his blessing without the surrendering of your will, the confession of yourself, and the submission to him. And then God says to him, I'm going to change that name. Now your name is Israel. The name means prince with God. It carries forth the idea, you now become a God-empowered man. Now stay with me. Jacob had already sown into his family conniving and deceit. When you read Genesis 34, his daughter is raped. And his boys slaughter these people. And Jacob had lived his life as a Christian, wrestling with who's going to control his life. And in the moments of his fleshly direction, he put a seed into his family that was terrible. His own boys uh, later would try to kill his own son. But God says, Jacob, I got a plan for you, a great plan. But Jacob, you, you, you can't do this in your own power or your own will. You, you can't do this with what you have. You, you need my empowerment. You need my blessing. You need to surrender that to me. And when Jacob confesses himself as to who he is and acknowledges that and surrenders, God gives him a new name empowered by God. And when you read the rest of his life, that's how Jacob lives his life. For the rest of his life, Jacob limps. You ought to read about in a moment, a few chapters later, when the pressure comes the next time, that man who had surrendered himself to the Lord gets all of his boys and they go back to Bethel and he limps up there, a defeated yet victorious man, and says, we're here to trust the Lord and God does amazing things. So let me close this. Why do I start here? I start here, men, because I'm building to Mordecai on Father's Day. And before I ever get to Mordecai, I need to get you to understand that wrestling with God over the control of my life, over the direction of my life, will never be life that will be peaceful or blessed. It causes anxiety, fear, and stress. God came to a man who desperately wanted to be blessed by God, and God said, you got to surrender. And that man fought until God took his leverage away, and then he clung. And when he clung to the Lord, he confessed to the Lord. I have learned this. We don't know our heart fully, but everybody in this room knows if we're really surrendered to the Lord or not. Everybody in the room knows if you're really surrendered to the Lord or not. You can pray the most beautiful prayers and you can come to church and you can do those things. But pressure turns to stress as I wrestle who 
who's in charge of my life. The best thing we can do is surrender our lives to the all-knowing God. Amen. Um, Pastor, my life's not working out right now. Pastor, I'm facing a lot of... It feels like everything's closing in. I got problems in the past that I'm running to into the future. It feels like I can't get my footing. Yep, yep. God's bringing you in. And he will meet you exactly as you need to be met to get you to the point where you say, Okay, Lord, I surrender. Do you have Hosea in your Bible? Or did you already close up and you're at lunch? <laughs> Hosea chapter 12, we'll just read one or two verses. God is using this moment as an illustration in Israel's mind as a nation. And the Lord wants the Israel to, to, to turn and he goes in here, and, he, and if you see in verse number two, he uses Jacob. In verse number three, he talks about, this is chapter 12 of Hosea. He took his brother by the heel in the womb. That was his old man, his old way. And by strength, he had power with God. That's what the work that God did with him. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, which is a great message. And there he spake with us. Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. Now watch, because of Jacob's story, verse number six, therefore, what's that word? Turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God, how? Continually. God took what happened in Jacob's life to be a testimony to the nation of Israel. And God said, Israel... If you want my blessing, you're going to have to surrender to me. You can't wrestle in wills. You can't wrestle away into the old man. You're going to have to find power with me, authority with me, submission to me. And when you do that, then God is able to use our lives. Men, if you're wrestling with God over who's in control of your life, eventually life's going to catch up to you. God will make sure that happens. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, God, clear and beautiful picture of how you get a hold of our attention in our lives. Jacob was a man wrestling. It wasn't that he wasn't a believer. It wasn't that he didn't know what to do. He just couldn't fully surrender up until that moment. He thought he had to manipulate, connive, trick, deceive. But you had a God plan for him that would not work that way. God, for the men and women in this room, you have a plan for our lives that will take the Holy Spirit power. Not our ability, your ability. We get in trouble, we pray. Then we stand right up from prayer and go back in, to our own way. And you put us in pressure moments where we're all alone and greatly afraid and and. And then those moments turn to stress. And in our minds, we're trying to figure out life. Instead, we should be dropping to our knees and surrendering to the one that knows everything. Jacob got up off that floor, forever walking and limp. But he got up off that floor with the power and protection of God. No longer was he that old deceiver. He was a new man. Lord, I want for the men and women of Plantation Baptist Church 
to not wrestle away authority in their life, but to submit to the authority of Jesus Christ. Have your blessing on our lives.